Okay. All right, to summarize. So basically, YQRS, I'm assuming, you know, based when we talk about the, um, the uh, backup generators, you're probably in the 20 to 40 range, you're in the 40 range here, we're assuming it's a six second strip. And then I start to say, okay, well, you know, it's probably a third degree, right? But let's confirm it. So the last thing you should do, or first thing, whatever you want to do, is you have to walk out your P waves. So if you have a separation, if somewhere between the SA node and the, and the uh, ventricles got cut, and you don't have that, like, that feedback, right? Because the feedback is basically the SA node is always pacing at a half faster rate, and it, every time it paces, it suppresses the lower junctional area and the Purkinje fibers and ventricles. So they're like waiting for their big day. And I would probably say is that they actually really want to do what they want to do. And they've been waiting to be called up. It's like the B team, C team, right? But every time they're like, yep, 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 yep please, 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 please. The SA no comes in, just whacks them across the head and says, not today, kiddo. And so then they, you know, you know, lose their vigor. And then, but then, you know, Whatever the milliseconds are later, they're like, okay, okay, now, now, now. And every time, so if they're if the big kids in the block aren't there to slap them down, then it's their turn and stuff. They'll take over. So then what I do is I say, well, look, are the R waves the exact same distance across? If it's coming from one foci, they're going to be exactly the same. So that's called marching out. I, this paper is not lined up, but I'd say, oh, perfect. This matches. This matches. And as you keep going, it matches. Strong indicator that yep, that's probably just a ventricle on its own, because technically it's supposed to respond to the junction foci or the uh, atrial foci or SA node because that's the primary generator. So you would hopefully see some type of relationship between here. The next thing I do to, to determine that there is no relationship is well, obviously P wave nothing comes after, so it might be a junctional block, but who knows? I then say, okay, well, let's find two P waves that we know there's nothing in between that can hide them because you can have one hiding here. So I put these two together. And right now, like, it's this corner of the paper to where my finger is. And now I march it out. And you see, look, it matches. It matches. It matches. So I know that the SA node, if this is an SA node or this is an H, you'll still have the same, you won't know. But that's the SA node. It's doing its job, but it's not getting down to the Purkinje fibers. And the junction is obviously not helping at all. So third degree heart block. Third degree heart block. You will get patients into EP lab in third degree heart block. How do you take care of these patients? Basically, you minimize everything. You do not give anesthesia until they are ready to cut and make incision. Because if you shoot them up with fentanyl, you give them anything, and you put them lower than this, you might be coding them, right? So if they come to you without being with, without transvenous pacer, pad pacers are more emergency, and they're perfusing with this, this rate, it can happen. I've had these patients. Don't kill the patient by saying, like, to a verse ed, 100 fentanyl, give them, like, 50 a probe, like... Please don't do that. We sometimes get into this habit of cookie cutter anesthesia. Treat every patient for who they are and the circumstance for what you're doing. And as I say, Vana, yeah. how do you uh, titrate the anesthesia? Slow. No, to the patient's <laughs> needs. Maybe I, didn't, I might have not said it to her, but I'll say it to you in your clinical. Like they might need 2.5% percent expiratory SIBO when they're getting an incision from here down to their belly button, but after you intubate them and you're not touching them, they don't need that much. So I'll see people pushing Neo all day long, and I'm like, why Like, why are they that deep? Oh, and, or you didn't account for the synergistic effects of fentanyl, Versed, and everything else you gave the 90-year-old, and they're on 2%. Like, did you age adjust it at all? Like, uh, like I try when I have you for clinical, I try to implement some of the didactic stuff into the clinical because you start to see like why we calculate age adjusted MAC, right? And how synergy is actually clinically relevant and stuff. So these will be patients in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And if they're perfusing now, they're gonna live. You can do a pacemaker with local only. So you're a luxury as a CRNA being in, a, in an EP lab with a 90 year old that's in third degree. So do it under local and survive or feel bad that they're uncomfortable on the bed and you know possibly knock out that last little drive in their ventricles. You tell me which one you'll go home feeling good about yourself. All right, next one. 
fast heart rate, it's time to stack a card. I'm going to give it away as we keep going. So basically, R waves are all consistent. S, uh, uh, P waves are all consistent. They're, they look like the same morphology throughout. These are not the best ones. And I think these terrible EKGs or uh, strips are from AHA, unfortunately. Um, but what you can do is, is uh, let's assume it's a six-second strip. So how many R waves are in a six-second strip here? 18. 18. So anything greater than what is sinus tachycardia? Well, that if it's if there's 18, then it's um it's SVT. Yeah, if it's over 150. It's SVT. Is there really 18? I think so. Basically, if you're over you know 100 for the most part, you're probably sinus tach. Over 150, you're SVT. And this can be obviously uh, that SVT um, is not normal. We treat that with what? Adenosine. How do you dose your adenosine? They now just say six and 12. They make our life difficult. Go down to EP lab and you'll give like. 20, 30 of adenosine sometimes. It's like a never ending, you're giving adenosine when you're trying to map out these hearts and stuff. So, you know, it's like, but the book says that. All right, what is this? This is V-fib, correct? And then you can go a step further and describe that these are fine or coarse. It's coarse. It can get a little confusing as you look at this. This can sometimes look like electrical um, interference from the bovie and stuff. The first thing you do when you see this, and the, the larger go off, it's gonna be like, Alarm, alarm, you know, I, I don't know what it says on there, but it's going to say like VTAC or something probably. It's going to probably not know VFib. It's going to say VTAC in the monitor. It's going to three-star alarm. And before you panic and start thumping on this guy's chest, what do you do to know it's not? Pulse socks. Pulse socks and tidal. See how we're pulling all together, right? You would not be perfusing if you had no cardiac output. If you have no cardiac output, you have no oxygen delivery to cells. If you have no oxygen delivery to cells, you don't go through the electron transport chain and then the Krebs cycle, and you get what? CO2. Long-winded answer, but CO2 is a, an indirect way of gauging cardiac output, and you can do that in every case. When you look at your end tidal and you pop them on the ventilator, you don't do anything else, and our end tidal goes from 40 to 25, you don't even need to cycle of blood pressure. We'll treat the blood pressure, they are probably hypotensive. You can treat, you can cycle it, but you know how long it takes to cycle blood pressure. Um, and that's obviously only if the ventilator settings are, are constant. If you're changing the vent settings, then you, you're changing the CO2. So if you left the vent at the same thing, at the same rate, tidal volume, so minute ventilation, and the heart changes what it's doing, the end tidal will change as a result. So it's a, it's a surrogate to sort of blood pressure monitoring and stuff. And you're sat, you're looking for a pleth. If you have a pleth, you do not have a pulse with V-fib, never. You might have a pulse with VTAC. What are the two shockable rhythms? Okay, you're gonna shock this, right? They're not gonna have a pulse, you're gonna shock it. You can feel for a pulse, but you better be calling for the AD and then feel for a pulse. What are you gonna shock an adult patient with? How many joules? Manual defibrillators that we work with. You could get away with 360, but technically the answer is 200 for biphasic devices. It shoots up and back, right? But you could go off. We do all sorts of weird things down. We'll, we'll, we'll shock people out of AFib with 200 joules. It's like, there's no right reason. But for ACLS, we need to do it based on what ACLS says. All right. What is this? So first of all, I see a P wave, QRS. A, a small Q, a T wave, and it's flow. How many, what's the rate of this? So it looks like sinus, it looks like a rhythm that's sort of sinus. Is it four? It's one other thing that I forgot to tell you guys. You only count it if it's the whole thing, the whole complex is within the six second strip. And again, this doesn't have the lines, so we're just assuming six second slip. So it's 30, right? The difference between 40 and 30 is quite a bit, right? That's a 25% decrease in your heart rate and stuff. Um, so again, sinus Brady. And now if this happens when you insufflate someone with CO2 in the middle of the OR, <laughs> oh, ho, what do you do? Yeah, the, probably if you're 30, just, hey, it's going to three-star alarm. We're bradycardic, drop the insufflation. They're not operating. It's easy. Drop the insufflation. It's really easy. It's like it takes you 30 seconds. It takes you five seconds to release it. Like just release it. That's probably your best answer. If that doesn't work, again, you're assuming now, and you're going to see the CO2 drop because of this. Every breath is is representative of the last, like you know, in this case, only like couple contractions, right? It's so slow, but it's like a representation of the contractions, the cardiac output. You'll see the CO2 drop. 
What's the next thing you can do? What's the thing you think you should do? Besides panic, scream, run out, you know, <laughs> yell at the surgeon, throw stuff. Those are things we're not well, we're not tolerating anymore at Yale, but you could do that. But what's the next best thing? Pressure. What's that? Glyco. Glyco. Okay. That might work. Atropine. Why would atropine be better than glyco? Well, it's faster. It's faster. Yeah. Reversal. Think back to reversals. The way you pair your reversals with your acetylcholine acetate inhibitors with your um, uh, muscarinic or uh, drugs, right, uh, is slightly different, right? Like longer acting, shorter acting, they started to try and pair them and stuff. We just typically give neostigmine and glyco, but technically there's they'll, they'll ask you questions like that on the boards maybe, I don't know, but they'll ask you questions in your pharmacology. Atropine is faster. If I'm in a, oh my God, like there are 30, my end title is 25, the, the cuff's not cycling, right? Because it's so low and you're, you're taking the insufflation out, I would probably shoot for atropine. Once you give atropine, you can't get it back though, okay? That's the downside. The glyco is going to take like five to eight minutes to start working. So I know I'll, I work with the people that are CRNAs, uh, physicians, and they'll give glyco, but it's it really doesn't make sense to be the most appropriate. If you pre-give glyco before you insufflate, maybe it does help. I've never seen a study that says so, but it would make make it seem as if you're inhibiting that response by giving it ahead of time from the muscular receptors and stuff, the M receptors. But if you really need to treat it fast, atropine. The other option is to give epi. We're not coding the patient, but you could give micro doses of epi and stuff. I almost always find that if you take the insulation down, you're fine. Okay? Can I ask a question? Yep. Um, first of all, we were talking about the atropine dose. We thought it was originally 0.5 milligrams, and then ACLS now says one. So, and I also thought we learned like 0.4 in class. So what dose would you give in that situation? I would, unless you know, unless I could read something, I would just give the the correct dose of at atropine. One, I think there was some thoughts that if you underdose people, that actually could have the reverse effect. So if they're saying one, I would just give one, or I would probably just, I mean, I'd probably just comfortably like hit them up with like a little, like maybe like you know, 40 mics of epi and stuff. Okay. I might just do that, um, but. Gotcha. I, I've never had to get to that point, you know, knock on wood. I had to get to that point. So, um, and you can sometimes get away with like a little bit of ephedrine and stuff to try and help them, but that's, that's a little bit faster than glyco, you know, but still, you know, it's not the strongest, but it is beta, beta to alpha seven to one, right? Um, all right. What is this? It, it may be, but there's something there, you know, there is something there. So V fib. Yeah. And you know, A systole or V fib, yeah. you're still gonna do the same thing, you're gonna start pounding on the chest, right? This is fine V fib. You'll never have a pulse with V fib, whether it's coarse or fine. Get a defibrillator, it's the only way to fix it. And you buy time by doing CPR. You buy time by giving epinephrine. I mean you're just vasoconstricting so that every single contraction when you pump their chest gets to their brain with an adequate pressure delivery oxygen. I mean that's it. Epi's never gonna fix it. What is that? VTAC. And what kind of VTAC? Monomorphic. monomorphic. Good. Yeah, so this is a monomorphic VTAC. Um, we'll induce this sometimes in the hospital when you do EP, CL service of an EP. It makes you kind of like, it's the best place to learn ACLS. Um, some people will be in this rhythm, the emergency room, and if you guys are in the ED, you've probably seen this, and all you have to ask yourself is like, are, do they have a perfusing pulse? And for stability in ACLS, is, is, it, is it greater than 90 for stalled pulse? And I think now they're saying NAPS now. I think they use NAPS now, it's like 65. So if you're awake and you're not like dying this second, there's you can technically give adenosine now for Y complex tachycardia, um, but this is someone that you're probably going to have to cardiovert and stuff, okay? And if they're unstable, you have to cardiovert. You don't do drugs, you cardiovert unstable less than 90, less than 65 or not. You always do shock. It's not like, and we, it's word salads. So you're like, oh, it's not like defib. It's, you know, you say you're gonna, you know, cardiovert and stuff, you know, whatever. But you're just shocking with different joules, right? So you, diff, you just shock with a lower joules. Maybe you do a hundred joules to shock this person out of this. Okay, what about this?
Weird one, right? A lot going on here. So the R waves are not consistent. Something's missing. You're missing some R waves in the same, you know, sequence. I see R waves. I see P waves. I see ST depressions. Um, so as I'm sort of looking through this rhythm, I'm asking yourself, what is it all related? I don't see a wide QRS complex, so I'm thinking that, you know, there, this might not be like, you know, distal, like hiss or ventricles. This might be something slightly above it, um, but it's not normal, right? All the R, uh, P waves look the same morphology, basically. So probably second degree, right? So is it type one or type two? So this is how I look at type one, type two. First, the easiest thing with type one is if you see an elongation of the PR interval. So first, it has a PR interval that's long. Okay, easy, right? It's first degree at a minimum. Um, what makes it second degree is that you start to see a prolongation and then a drop. When you drop an R wave, it's second degree. The type one or wonky bach is going to be dropping an R wave. Type two, you don't uh, you don't have a, a continual elongation. You just drop it. Okay, and that's more pathological, and that's past the bundle down towards like um, to pass the AV node down towards the bundle hiss. So what I'm seeing here is I see a drop. I see a drop. That doesn't tell me anything. Right after the drop, look at your next PR wave. That's your starting length. It's long greater than 0.2. I then look at the next wave. It's longer. Maybe not. I don't know. This compared to that is definitely longer. So I go one, two, three, four. I have a four to one type one uh, AV block. So it's Wenke block. And then I have ST segment depressions. I should get an EKG on to figure out what's going on. And, it pro and that might be an inverted T wave in there as, as well. There is right here. Oh, you can't see my mouse. Um, you can when I go like this. I don't know. Here. Yeah. Okay, so right here looks like a positive uh, T wave, positive T. So this could be actually your T wave. Um, your J points down here, and it's definitely depressed. Okay. The next one. All right, what is this? Flutter. Yeah, A flutter. But, but, but you know, you can, you can basically take from the V flutter or uh, V fib and stuff that you know you're not going to have like a you know you're going to have a you're going to have a decreased amount of preload from your atrium when you're in flutter not as bad as a fib but this is atrial flutter and these are like the spike teeth of shark teeth that are here and stuff and this looks like a four to one flutter or three to one one uh it's hard to tell because it could be in with the t wave but it kind of looks like one two three four to one flutter and stuff the, the the narrower the conduction and the relationship between the atrium and the ventricles, the more unstable you get. If you had a one-to-one -one conduction with this rate, think about it. You would have you have four to one here, so you can quickly say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You could just assume there's seven R waves, and for every seven R waves, there's four atrial waves, right? Seven um, times four is what? And then times ten seconds is what? If you were 280 one-to-one -one conduction, you would not have a pulse, right? So we're glad that the AV node and the calcium there slows down those conductions so that it doesn't go one-to-one, -one, hopefully. The more it does go one-to-one -one or closer to one-to-two, one-to-three, and you're unable to drop it with, you know, drugs, right? Maybe like a calcium channel blocker, beta blocker, you may have an unstable patient. All right, what is that? Has anyone ever had that in real life? Yeah. yeah. Ooh. Wow. What, what, what happened? Uh, yeah. Did you, like, push Haldol and be like, yeah, you're a nasty patient, 20 of Haldol? No, wait, what happened? Like, what's the, do you remember what was up with it? Um, honestly, I don't remember what caused it. I worked in CTSU, so, like, we would have things like this happen. But um, we just gave Matt and him right out. How much? Oh, jeez. What the book says and what actually happens is always almost never uh, the same. I think, to be honest, it was an amp that we pushed, and then we clogged our back, and that was... Okay. Yeah, I can't think of how much it's going to be. But it was literally, like, we, from the code car, we just drew the whole thing up and slammed it right in. Nice. He came, like, almost immediately out of it. If you give mag and you give non-depolarizing drugs, 
what happens. So last one should keep that in mind, right? Oh, I don't have any twitches. After if you gave mag and you gave just to tie it all in, you gave mag, you gave non polarizer, and you're like, I don't have any twitches, and you're like, you know, what do I do? Well, you know, it's not much you can do except we have Sugamidex now. So if you use a non depolarizer that's reversible, you would theoretically i mean you know who who has like who gives mag and then tests like does a test and like research and has 100 patients to actually get a live you know reliable test but yeah yeah hey hold on a second while you're about to code the patient like let's give some non-depolarizers and intubate but um but you know if you gave something other than your um uh, your amino steroids so your amino steroids being the most common is macaronium macaronium but it's also um uh, pancoronium, if you can find it. I've never seen it, but it's, everyone loved it because it lasted so long. Uh, you can reverse those with Scamidex. They say that, you know, the VEC isn't as easy to reverse as ROC. I haven't seen it clinically, but I mean, that's what they say. Um, but if you gave cystatricurium, though, which is a drug that is available and you can give, you may not be able to reverse them because you don't have any option of Sugamidex. You're screwed. You have like five neostigmine you can give. You know what I mean? Like you've got, you're going to tachyphylaxis your stigmine and you're not going to get back anything. And really, yeah. So reversing even with like one twitch is a, just a bad idea, you know? So, um, all right. So give, a, give one or two grams of mag is relatively the answer if you go to ob and you do ob which i don't do anymore and i definitely don't do ob over here where everyone's like super high risk complicated um you might have people who are going through what they need mag uh, and what happens in preeclampsia hypertension a lot of different things seizures right a lot of things and you treat it with mag so mag can vasodilate the patient as well so you know again my lower your blood pressure and stuff so just keep that in mind but we give like five grams of mag six grams of mag like we make them all like loosey-goosey muscular wise right but also like it helps with that all right what am i seeing here yeah good job so uh that's a different relation <laughs> that's all uh, you're having a bad day in the or and that looks like I would say like course V-fib, you shock them, and you get back something relatively normal, right? The question is though is first of all, uh, what do you do when you shock? What do physically, if you're the team leader, because technically if ACLS providers is not Pete and pals, you're the team leader, right? That's one of your possible roles. Like you don't get to just be like, I'm gonna push drugs. It's like, you might be in a solo practice and I can tell you orthopedic surgeons, they are ACLS trained, they do not know how to run a code and stuff. <laughs> you're the best bet that patient has and you're, both your butts are getting sued, so you better know this stuff. Defib the patient, and sometimes people just blow out of fat embolism, right? And the code, like you could be in surgery centers where you're just thinking it will never happen, it's gonna happen. So you defib the patient, then what do you tell your team to do? Continue CPR. Don't waste time checking for pulses. What do you think your heart, who just got hit by a uh, by a bus, you think the heart's gonna get up and be like back to business? Like, <laughs> no, it's stunned. So you know, and this is AHA. They've done a lot of research studies, so we're gonna just trust them. And basically, they're gonna say, well, it's not at its full potential. So do a full cycle of CPR or finish your CPR, then check a pulse and stuff. If Johnny wakes up and swinging at you, stop doing compressions. <laughs> One of my earliest experiences of someone who came into ED, like I got an ED job, like just to have extra cash flow when I was living in Jersey when I was like 20, 20, maybe 20, I want to say 20. And uh, I was like, I was like not there for the, you know, the entertainment. I was just there to, I needed just extra cash. It was Jersey Shore and we spent a lot of money enjoying our lives, right? The best of our lives. And we lived like two blocks from the beach. We had it, we had no money. So. I always like to have the magazine and be like watching the psych patients. The psych patients were uh, apt to run away. We lost a couple, never on my watch. I was ready to tackle them. But um, I'd be able to read my magazine the whole day, so I was like totally happy with that. And I definitely think I got girly magazines too. Like I was, I liked all that stuff. I had the gossip magazine. But I got to like get paid to see that. But anyways, long story short, one of those days, oh, they wore paper scrubs. And I always, I, I found out that the way that the, they wore paper scrubs because when you run, you don't run down the road, you run into the woods. And when you run into the woods, it rips all your clothes off. And then most people, even if, you know, they're there for psych reasons, you know, it's not necessarily like, 
when you think of like mental, it's like people are always having a bad time. Like, you know, there's people who have you know suicide, suicide reality. Like, they're rational. It's just they're having a bad time. Their but if they do decide they're wrong because they were committed by the police, um, most people are too embarrassed to run around naked. So then we usually catch them. But uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. So a patient came in and coded. Like I went out to get someone who was having chest pain. I, I was attacked. You know, I went out to get a patient with chest pain and he coded like right in front of me and the nurse and stuff. And I'm literally like like doing compressions on this guy and they're wheeling all of us back into the mini ED bay, it's a small ED. And like within like, I don't even know if we gave a shock, I can't remember, but he woke up. He woke up. Like he literally, they, I'm gonna say they shocked him. And like, cause that makes the most sense. Shocked him, that H's and T's, woke up. He's like, what's what happened? And I'm just sitting there like, dude, you died. Like, <laughs> cause even to myself, I was like, this is so surreal. Like this is pre, no, this is obviously after um, they came out with um, um, what's the movie? I'll show everyone loves like uh, Crazy Anatomy. Yeah. yeah, you know, doctors showing up and like they're like extricating people from the rubble. Like that doesn't happen. And I was like, wow, this actually can happen. And so it was pretty surreal. So you can save a life, but if they don't wake up, keep doing uh, compressions and stuff, and then check up walls. Um, all right, what is this? This is SVT. So the only thing with SVT is uh, you can give them adenosine, check for their hemodynamic stability, right? Because this is such a fast rhythm. The reason why they end up having low blood pressures is why? They can't fill. They can't fill. It's go, 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 go. Eventually, if you don't drink water, right, or you don't re rehydrate and stuff, you're out of gas. So they're, the, your filling time is zero. The other thing that's zero, which is why we don't like fast heart rates, especially in people as they age, is that you don't fill your coronaries. The coronaries that sit just distal to the aortic, uh, the aortic valve and stuff uh, through the sinus there, they fill during diastole. And you have two parts of your heart. So if you think of your heart, you have the epicardium and the endocardium. The epicardium, where the vessels are trans, you know, Tr transposed across the whole heart does relatively okay throughout the entire cardiac cycle so systole diastole but the endocardium which is sort of like the meat between the buns there it doesn't do well when you squeeze it so when you squeeze it and you contract so you have an r wave you're not perfusing your sub endocardium and that's where we get our mis and stuff because we get ischemia to the myocardium so, because it just doesn't perfuse, like you're, you're, you're pushing on it every single time. So you need diastole to fill your ventricle, but at the same time to also after that last contraction, that static pressure in the aorta to be able to fill the, the uh, sinus and fill the coronaries in the subendocardium. So these people, if you leave them in this type of tachycardia for too long, especially SVT, they're going to have an MI, okay? It's just a matter of time. Before you went to adenosine, can you do like metoprolol or dilt first? Oh, yeah. So, uh, Yes, and the reason why people do adenosine a lot of times is just to figure out what the underlying cause oh, is. Right. But yes, you can beta block them or you can use a calcium channel blocker that works on the AB node. Absolutely, you can do that. You can also do like like non-pharmacological things such as like, um, uh, I don't know if the carotid massages are still in vogue, but like carotid massage theoretically, I, I get expert consults on this and stuff. What I would do is have someone bear down. So be like, pretend like you're gonna poop in your pants. Like, <laughs> that's like a, you know, a vagal maneuver, right? Vagaling, people actually go to the bathroom and fall. I used to work on the ambulance. There's, I know there's some EMTs here that have been there. They go, oh, Nani fell over in the bathroom. Well, Nani needs to take more Senna and hold it. <laughs> um, so that's a possibility. The other thing is, is like when you do peds and stuff and if they go in SVT, like you can't tell a two year old to like, you know, bear down, right? So you just, you can throw ice at their face. <laughs> I think it's so cruel, but I know you can throw ice, be like, you'll come in, be like, oh, you're so cute, bam, like just make sure the ice is not a cube, you know, <laughs> um, but it's a, you can do it, um, so that's like one of, the, one of the things you can do. Okay, so now let's take some anesthetic like considerations here. If, if you had a patient in the OR who's SVTing on you and stuff, and you want to try and break it, you can vagal a patient who's intubated. How would you do that? Increase your intrathoracic pressure on your ventilator. There's one of two ways you can do it. And this is where you, you could say, like, do a valsalva maneuver. Can you do a, uh, I forget what else they call it, but like they'll ask you for like a valsalva maneuver. Or like the surgeon might say, can you give me 30 for like 10 seconds? It's a valsalva maneuver and stuff. And then on the, um, I'm trying to think what the word is on the machine. So you can do it by A, pop them off the ventilator, go to bag mode, 
close your pop off to like between 30 and 40, but you have to make sure your flows are high enough. If your flows are high enough, the bag's never gonna fill up and then be this 30 of sodomies or water or 40. You gotta like, so you gotta turn your flows up and then hold the bag and then watch your little gauge and hold it at 30 or hold it at 40. And you just have to varying levels of holding it tight or letting it out to keep it at 30 or 40 for 10 seconds. It's A, a recruitment exercise. Mm -hmm. It's recruiting because you're giving a lot of peep, static peep, 30 to 40 centimeters of water over the course of 10 seconds. It's gonna help re-recruit alveoli. But in this case, you're doing it for not the not for that purpose, but because you're trying to increase intrathoracic pressure, which it also does in order to vagal them. So, you know, it could be doing it for a lot of different reasons. It could be recruitment, it could be because you're trying to break SVT, or it could be because, um, you know, you forgot to open your pop off after you switched them over the ventilator, which you do. Don't do that. You're all going to do it. And uh, so what's going to happen is, is when you're like, oh, my God, like they're breathing and they're moving, you're going to pop them off. And then you're going to be like grabbing probe to get the patient deeper. And then meanwhile, the bag is like ballooning. It's at 40 centimeters of water. And then they're bradycardic, which you probably aren't at this point because they're, they're fighting the ventilator. But like, again, that's not healthy and stuff for the patient. So, um, so just think of those things. Um, if you do do these recruitment exercises because you go through what's known as cyclic allotasis and stuff, you've, every time you in, you intubate, you detach them, hook them back up the vent, take them off the vent, not ventilate them, they de recruit a ton. Um, so you might need to do this throughout the cases anyways. And you're always fighting all the other problems with positioning. So doing these exercises is actually good throughout a case. I think Marianne even will do it all the time just to keep it like keep things kosher. Uh, I think it's great. Um, so it's a good thing. Um, but when you do it, just be cognizant and watch your end time. If you have an A line, you'll see them drop their blood pressures. Some people who are very under resuscitated with fluid, which is most of our patients who are MPO for 12 hours because we don't pay attention to you know ERAS guidelines, will drop their blood pressures. <laughs> we just, if they have a cuff on and it's cycling every five minutes, you just don't know. <laughs> but if you have an A-line, you know. All right, what, what is this? Second, you said that there were two, so the one was going on the pop-off valve and doing it 30 to 40 for 10 seconds. What was the second way we did that? Sorry. Also? Go to the go to the monitor under I think it's under procedures. We'll go in the hour and we'll see this. And I think it's procedures. And then basically it's a vital capacity breath, mm -hmm. and that's what it's called. And then you just preset it. Vital capacity breath for how many seconds you want, for how many centimeters of water, 30 to 40s on average. This uh, and this kind of also goes back to physiology. When you add a lot of intrathoracic pressure, it backs up venous return to the heart, and that's why you drop your your blood pressure because you dropped your preload. But you'll see that um, you'll see that pressure is transmit to other areas of the body. ICPs will go up, right? And if ICPs go up, you'll have pressures of the CSF will sort of be backed up. And so when they're doing back surgeries and they're looking for dural tears, they'll have you do this to see if there's a leak. Mm -hmm. So it kind of is like, wow, it all kind of comes together, right? It's kind of cool you know, how this, all this works and stuff. So then you think, if I have somebody on PEEP during a, a procedure with high ICPs, like maybe be careful with leaving your PEEP high because that's static pressure. That's going to decrease venous return. So you got to start thinking about these things and stuff. Interocular pressures. I'm not saying not to do it, but just know that this theoretically, in theory, textbook might affect it. Interocular pressures, your your arteries, your eyes, is, is it's, it's pretty much an end artery. So it's very, very much affected by intraocular pressures. Intraocular pressures can be affected by the aqueous humor discharge into the venous system so again it could theoretically make it worse right that's why their necks are neutral and you don't have anything on their necks because now you're gonna have eye problems right what is this is that type two type two and second degree we've already done first so it's probably the second degree but yeah so uh slightly wider qrs is in second degree that's a usually giveaway if you were to measure out the R waves are P waves. P waves is basically the size of the paper. Wow, look at that. We, we lose it off screen. We go here, wow, look at that, look at that. And normally you'll lose one in the R QRS, but this one happened to kind of all be shown. But they all match out. The R waves don't match out because they're still responsive. They get reset every time they have an R wave that gets through. So you don't see third degree, right? But um, what you do see is a more consistent PR interval. It's usually wide, greater than 0.2. But it's almost always a defect at one area in the, in the His bundle, so it stays the same. This stays the same, it stays the same. But you do drop a beat. You drop a beat, it's second degree. And in this case, we sort of said the different things that contribute to it. So it's uh, type 2, or second degree type 2, which is Mobitz. And uh, the, this, 
Atrial depolarization looks biphasic. There's more than one wave in there, and so that might be atrial enlargement, too. 